time you have a carbon that combines with two oxygens, uh, it will always be carbon dioxide. Okay, it will always have those properties of carbon dioxide. And it will always, carbon dioxide, you can go look at it the other way, carbon dioxide will always be composed of the simple whole numbers 1C and 2O. Okay, just like if we have carbon monoxide, it would be 1C and 1O. And the properties of every molecule that have those two com combined, combined um, will have the properties of carbon monoxide. Okay? Um, chemical change involves joining, separating, or rearranging atoms. Of course, you could imagine, like we've done before, taking two, sodi two sodium and one molecule of chlorine. We can rearrange these atoms to form two ion pairs of sodium chloride. Okay? And this has different properties than this, which have different properties than this. Okay? They all have different properties. It all <coughs> depends on the types and the ways that the atoms are combining with each other to form these compounds. Okay, so, yeah, we learned the simplest form of matter is an atom. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case, because if it was, then we wouldn't have to learn any more about it, right? But there were experiments after that that figured out, well, there's simpler forms of matter. The atom is actually composed of other things, uh, an electron and a nucleus. So atoms consist of three primary particles, electrons, which are negatively charged particles, which you'll find, let's draw kind of a depiction of an atom. We'll draw a depiction of a, a helium atom. Okay. So a helium atom, it's got a nucleus, two, we'll put two white dots there. That would be the nucleus of a helium atom. And around that nucleus, it's really kind of a shell. So don't think of it like kind of a orbit like planets. Okay, so it's kind of like you got a whole sphere around this thing. Okay. And in that sphere, somewhere, you're going to find two other dots. We'll color them. So that's what a helium atom looks like. Okay, again, that's a representation of a helium atom. It's not really a helium atom. Uh, the electrons are the blue things. They're the negatively charged particles. Okay, so we draw them. Or a way to represent electrons. So if you ever see me draw E with the minus there, that's an electron. That's the way I'll be referring to electrons from now on. So you see we've got these two electrons out in the, this orbital here. Okay? And then we've got this small, dense, what's known as a positively charged region in the center of the atom, that green and white thing, of tightly bound uh, subatomic particles. Subatomic meaning below atomic level. Okay? Subatomic particles. We got protons in there. So the protons would maybe be the white things. So we would say two protons, and that's just a P with a plus, because the protons are the positively charged subatomic particles. And then we've got uh, the green guys, or the yellow guys, whatever it looks like to you. Um, they're called the neutrons. And we've got two of those as well. And we'll say N with a little zero, meaning no charge. So those are uncharged particles. So notice, remember when we were talking about different isotopes of atoms? Uh, the different isotopes of atoms have the same number of protons. It's their neutrons that are different. That's what gives them the different masses. Okay? So like, I don't know, chlorine, one chlorine atom could have uh, 37 uh, mass. Okay? So it would have 17 protons. 20 
that the composition of the atom, the type of atom that it is, is only suggested by the amount of protons that the atom has in its nucleus. So any atom that has 28 protons in its nucleus is a nickel atom. Okay? What we'll find is, you see these little numbers up in the right-hand corner there? One, two, three, four, five. That tells you how many protons the atoms have in their nucleus. Okay? That's known as the atomic number. Uh, all of these uh, are going to be given to you on the test. Of course, it's going to be, I'm not going to unbolt that every time we have a test. So it's going to be kind of your cheat sheet. Notice all these numbers all over this uh, periodic table. Okay? This is all you need to know about the periodic table. You need to know why it's set up that way and such and so forth. But uh, once you learn that, it's all given to you there. You don't really have to memorize anything. Okay? So, three primary particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. Electrons are outside the nucleus. Uh, protons and neutrons combine to form the nucleus. Okay? So you can see kind of what I've depicted there, the modern model of the atom. It's a dense nucleus of protons and neutrons. Accounts for virtually none of the volume. So very little of the volume, and virtually all of the mass. In fact, protons and neutrons are quite, um, quite heavy compared to electrons. <coughs> so the probability cloud, so that electron cloud or that electron shell, accounts for virtually all of the volume and virtually none of the mass. Um, a good representation people usually will show in like, textbooks, I think there's a picture in your textbook, is they'll have like a person holding a marble in the middle of an Olympic size uh, stadium. Okay? That marble would represent the nucleus and the Olympic size stadium would represent the electron cloud. So you can imagine how big the electron cloud is relative to the size of the nucleus. Okay? If you think about how big a marble is relative to an Olympic sized stadium. Okay? Very big and very small, I guess, <laughs> if you think about it. Okay? So in a neutral atom, which the periodic table shows only neutral atoms, uh, the number of electrons equals the number of protons. Okay? So every, so helium, this helium atom is a neutral atom, right? Because we've got two protons and two electrons. Okay? You can imagine atoms where they weren't neutral. Okay? Let's show them. Okay? Uh, we'll do lithium. Okay? So lithium is going to have, how many protons does lithium have in its nucleus? Three. Lithium is Li, by the way. So three uh, protons. And its mass number is seven. So it's going to have, so protons and neutrons weigh the same amount. Remember, and they account for all the mass. So, those, the bottom number there, that's the mass number, okay? So that's essentially 7, 6.9. Okay? So, if we have 3 protons, we're going to have 4 neutrons. Because 3 plus 4 equals 7. And the reason why that says 6.94 and not 7 is because there's different isotopes of lithium. Okay, so some of them weigh 7, some of them weigh 6. Okay? So if we look at the electron cloud around it, in fact, it's got two shells. In the first shell, we've got two electrons. And in the second shell, we've got a third electron. Okay? So it's going to have two electron shells. Don't worry, we'll get to it. Okay? Um, so, protons and electrons have charges that are equal in magnitude, but opposite. So one is negative one, the other one is positive one. Even though the mass of the two particles are quite extensively different. Okay? Um, yeah, neutral atom has no electrical charge. Some atoms, so this is a neutral atom, let's make it Instead, a positive atom, we have three protons here, three electrons. If we remove one of those electrons, right, we only 
have two electrons and three protons. It's still a lithium atom because it's got three protons, but it's going to be a lithium atom that has more positive charges than negative charges by one, so we would call it lithium plus. Okay? So what did we do here? Let's look at lithium regularly. Okay? Lithium has how many protons does it have? Look at this. Three protons. Okay, so let's write that down. Okay. So we know that the periodic table only shows us neutral atoms. So how many electrons does lithium have when it's neutral? Three, right? Because it has to be balanced. If we take one of those electrons away, how many electrons would lithium have now? Two. Okay. So we'd have two electrons. So three minus three is equals what? Zero, right? Three minus three equals zero. How many protons does it have to have if it's a lithium atom? Three always. Okay. So what is three minus two? One. And chemistry, we say positive one, or when we're showing it like that, we just put plus. Okay? That's how you do it. That's when lithium loses its last electron. Okay? We'll, know, we'll get to learn uh, more and more in depth about this. That's called the valence electron. The outer shell is known as the valence shell, and they like to lose or gain valence electrons. In fact, that's where all reactivity comes from. It's just that valence shell. Nothing else. Okay. Okay. So, like we said, there's some common symbols of electron, proton, and neutron. Ironically enough, a proton can be represented as P plus or as H plus, hydrogen plus. Okay. Because of course, how many protons does a hydrogen atom have? One proton. One proton. Right. You guys remember what I? where you could find the mass number up there. I know we're, we haven't gotten really in depth to it yet, but it's that bottom number, right? Bottom number right there. So that number is essentially what? It's one, right? So remember we said that number is the combination of the amount of neutrons and protons that we have in the nucleus. So how many protons does a hydrogen atom have in its nucleus? Or how many neutrons does a hydrogen atom have in its nucleus? Zero, right? Because one plus zero equals what? One, right? Is that number essentially one or is it essentially two? One, right? So if it has one proton, then it can't have had any neutrons, right? Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so how many electrons does a neutral hydrogen have, atom have? One, right? So we've got one proton and one electron. What would happen if we took that electron away? What would we have left? Well, let's let's draw this one. So hydrogen has, what did we say, one proton and one electron, right? If we remove that electron, what would we have? We would have hydrogen having how many protons? One proton. One proton. How many electrons? One. Zero electrons, right? So what would we represent this H as? H plus, right? What is H plus essentially? Just one proton, right? Because if we remove the electron, what do we have left? Just that proton, right? So a lot of times, in fact, uh, you'll see this, especially when we get to acid-base chemistry, this will be representation of a proton, H plus, because it essentially is just a proton. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, so you got got to know the sim symbolism, both this P plus and this H plus, because I'll be using them, and I don't want you to get too confused. Okay, because I'll use them just because that's what I use, you know, and you're gonna have to just deal with it, I guess, unfortunately. But um, you'll get used to it eventually. <coughs> uh, for right now, I'll try to only use the P plus for protons. Okay, just so you guys can. Step your way into it. Okay, notice the charge here negative one for the electron, positive one for the proton, zero for the neutron. Notice the mass of the electron is much, much smaller. The 
within the mass of the proton and neutron, which are essentially the same. So you can see here, this is essentially one, essentially one. AMU is the, the mass uh, unit that we use for measuring atoms, protons, and neutrons. Okay, so you're going to have to get used to this unit AMU, and we'll show you how to do calculations from grams to AMU and whatnot. And, but look how small the electron is relative to that. Very, very tiny. Okay. okay. So, which subatomic particles are represented by the pink stuff here? That's electrons, right? Clearly, because they're outside of the nucleus. What about the yellow and blue stuff? Protons and neutrons, right? Yeah, good job. Um, and what is this whole thing combined called? That little ball? The nucleus, okay? So hopefully you got that. Okay, so let's go back and look at the periodic table and look at these different elements. In fact, the periodic table represents each unique element, like we said before. Okay, and these are the elemental symbols. So for neon, it's NE. For oxygen, it's O. So usually, or always, you'll find the periodic table represents elements in a one or two letter um, symbol. These elements down here now have one or two letter symbol names. I think they're all two letters, but um, these are not, this just means the 110, 111, 112, because this was before they were actually named. So they just were named, I think, at the beginning of 2010, and we've got all the way up to here. Okay, so we're still making advances, if you can imagine, on the periodic table, which is amazing, I think. Yeah, and are they not on there either? Oh, just shows there's one book, there's no, no yeah, one. so they're not even on there. So they're so new that even the new chemistry book doesn't have them. If you can imagine that. So, symbols and formulas. A unique symbol is used to represent each element. A unique. Li is not the same as Vn. Okay? Uh, the symbol is based on the name of the element, lithium. That's why it's called Li. Uh, some of them are weird because they're either the Latin or the German name of the element. Like element 26, Fe, is iron. Okay? So you're going to have to kind of twist your thinking uh, to realize that this is named after the, the Latin name of iron, which is ferrous. Okay? Or ferrous. But you can see here, there's your elemental symbol for oxygen, fluorine, neon. That's the name. A lot of periodic tables will give you the name. I'll give you a periodic table that gives you the name of the element. Okay, so I don't expect you to memorize the name. So don't waste your time. Okay, if you go into 1411, then we'll start memorizing names of elements. Okay, but for right now, just concentrate on what the numbers of the periodic table mean. Uh, also, we've got this number up at the top. In this periodic table, it's in the top right. You'll either see it there or at the very top in most periodic tables. That uh, number represents what we call the atomic number, the number of protons in the uh, nucleus of that atom. And this number on the bottom, again, represents the mass number, and that's the number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. So notice the electrons don't contribute to the mass of the atom. They're so, so tiny that they don't contribute to the mass at all. Okay? You said the mass number is the protons plus neutrons? Protons plus neutrons. So it would be C plus. Here, let's just do that. Oh, I think we'll get to it in a second. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to it even more detail. <coughs> notice, you can see that these are all different elements, fluorine, fluorine, bromine, and Oh, well, we don't have a lot of there. Fluorine, bromine, and iodine. See, fluorine is this yellow gas. Bromine is this orange, kind of purple. 
different chemical properties, even though these ones, what you'll find is elements that are in the same column here. We call these either columns or families, okay? We call them families because they behave very similarly. Because it's because they have the same amount of electrons in their valence shell, okay? And remember, the valence shell determines all chemical reactivity, okay? So it doesn't matter how many neutrons, blah, 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 you know? It's all about the valence shell of electrons that determines chemical reactivity. So that's what we're going to concentrate most on in this class. Okay? But even though these guys are in a family, right, they all have similar properties, but they're not the same properties. Okay? Just like in your family, you guys kind of look the same, but you're not the same. Okay? That's exactly the same thing. Okay, so let's talk about compounds now. So a compound formula, so that would be the formula of a compound, like CO2 there, can re be represented in a variety of ways. Notice on the board already I've represented CO2 like that and like that. Okay, those are different formulas for CO2. Okay, one of them is known as the molecular formula, which is that. The other one is known as the structural formula, which is that. So this is, if you were a little person, small enough to see a carbon dioxide molecule, that, well, it would kind of look like that. It wouldn't say C and O, right? It would actually look more like a sausage, like that. Okay, that's what a carbon dioxide molecule would really look like, okay, if you were able to see it. Um, and in fact, this is what a water molecule would look like if you were able to really see it. It's kind of like a blob with two little things on the bottom, two little points. So this is called the ball and stick model. We could draw the ball and stick model for carbon dioxide if we wanted to. space-filling model would be kind of that sausage thing. Okay? Get it? Uh, if we, I guess we could fill it in more or less. burner before you like that. I, we haven't used a Bunsen burner yet, uh, but if you have a hot water heater at home, this is the stuff that comes out of the hot water heater. Or if you've got a gas stove at home, this is what comes out of the gas stove. Uh, water, of course, you guys are familiar with that stuff. Carbon monoxide, don't get too close to this stuff or it'll kill you. Um, that's why you got carbon monoxide detectors in your house, right? Carbon monoxide uh, looks a lot like oxygen. And in fact, uh, your, your enzyme that binds oxygen, anybody know what an enzyme is? Yeah. It's the things inside of you that kind of do stuff, the stuff that does stuff inside of you, okay? So one of the enzymes grabs oxygen and allows you to breathe, res to respire, actually. It's called respiration, and it's not the same kind of breathing in and breathing out that you're used to. It's something on totally on a molecular level. Still call it respiration though. But that enzyme actually binds better to carbon monoxide than it does to oxygen. And when it binds to carbon monoxide, it won't let it go because it binds so well, okay? Won't let it go. And then of course, when that enzyme interacts now with an oxygen molecule, it won't let that carbon monoxide molecule go so it can't interact with that oxygen molecule and the oxygen just floats away. That's, that's why carbon monoxide will kill you because it won't let that enzyme bind to oxygen. Okay. And then hydrogen peroxide, this is stuff you can pour on your house too, stuff like that. Very reactive stuff, that's why it kills everything. Okay, so let's practice with some compound formulas. Well, this stuff here, is a liquid known as carbon
carbon disulfide. It has a very similar structure to carbon dioxide. Remember I said that these are family. Look, oxygen and sulfur are in the same family. That's why they have the very similar structure, carbon disulfide and carbon dioxide. Let's look at the structure, the structural formula of carbon disulfide. Is that very closely uh, resembling carbon dioxide. Okay? But notice carbon disulfide is a liquid. Look at carbon in its atomic form, that black solid, right? That's like coal. Or uh, actually, diamond is uh, carbon in its atomic form, too. So, graphite, the stuff that you're writing with, that's carbon in its atomic form. And diamond is also, if you got a diamond ring kind of compare them, but they're both carbon in their atomic form. It's pretty interesting. But anyways, look at this stuff, and then this stuff is sulfur, okay? But if you combine these guys, you make this clear liquid. It's kind of interesting, right? So you can see the difference here really emphasizes the difference between chemical uh, and physical properties of these different um, substances. Okay, so if carbon dioxide, well, I gave you the answer. Carbon disulfide contains one atom of carbon for every two atoms of sulfur. What's the chemical formula for carbon disulfide? Well, I didn't really give it to you, but what would be the chemical formula for it? CO2. CO2. That's it. Carbon disulfide. Okay. And it's implied by the name, right? One carbon, two sulfides. So two sulfides. Disulfide. Pardon? Oh, why did I? That's their valence electron. We'll get to that later. Yeah, sorry, sorry for putting dots, but these are just little electrons that the software still has left over that it didn't use to bond. In fact, what you'll find is that those valence electrons, they, they're used for bonds, okay? That's, that's what bonds are formed from, is the valence electron. So this is actually two electrons, this is two electrons. So in between this is oxygen and carbon, there's four electrons that are sticking those things together. Those electrons are like glue, yeah. okay? So like glue for the atoms to stick together. Kind of. Don't, don't take that representation too far, but you can kind of think of them as sticking together. Okay, let's go back to the periodic table of elements and look at the symbols and formula. So remember we said that this is the atomic symbol of the particular element that you're interested in is this big X in the middle. That's the symbol of the atom. Z, this is going to be the atomic number. Okay, what did we also say was the atomic number? Is this little one up in the number top right? Huh? The number, the number of protons. Yeah, that'll be the number of protons. So whenever you're representing them like on the test or something, and I say draw the entire atomic symbol, you would want to start drawing things like this, okay? So, you'll get so used to this by the end of next week that it'll be old hat. Okay, so Z is the atomic number. A, there is the mass number, and C is the charge of the particle. You, for every one of these guys up on the periodic table, the charge of the particle is zero. Okay? This isn't the way that the uh, at the element is represented on the periodic table, okay? So this is different than the way the element is represented on the periodic table, so watch out. What will happen, what you'll find, is you'll see people writing things like
nucleus, protons and neutrons, so we know there's four neutrons, right? Because we know every element of lithium has three protons. And we also know the charge of the atom, right? Or the ion. Things that, that are charged are called ions. But um, this charge of this ion is plus one. Okay? So, um, let's see what we got. Uh, the charge is zero if the number of protons equals the number of electrons. So, when I represented hydrogen here, I didn't put any charge up there because it's zero. Okay? So you don't want to you don't usually put a zero right there. But notice I put one there because I had to indicate there was a charge because I had lost that electron. Does everybody see that? Okay, cool. Okay, so based on the following information, what's the atomic number of fluorine? How do you find that? Where can you find that by looking at this re representation? Yeah, what is it? It's not. No. Why do you say that? Because it's here. You can look at it there in the bottom left-hand corner. Or you could say, bam, it's fluorine. So let's look up there and say it's the ninth element. So it's got to have nine protons. Or the atomic number has to be nine. Uh, what's the mass number of fluorine? Where will we find that? It's going to be 19. How do you know that? Well, you can look up there in the periodic table, but if you only have this representation to look at, what would you say? It's the top left number, right? How many protons, or how many neutrons does fluorine 19 have? Six. How'd you figure that out? 19 minus 9 equals 6. Okay? You get that? You get that? You get that? Bam. You guys are so good, you don't even have to worry about the rest of this chapter. Okay. Let's try this one. How many protons does this atom have? What's the name of this? Does anybody know the name of this atom? Boron. Boron, yeah, just like chemistry class, right? Boron. <laughs> okay, so how many uh, uh, how many protons does boron have? Five protons. How many neutrons does boron eleven have? Six electrons. And what's the charge of this atom? different mass, so they have slightly different properties. 
But we call these types of atoms our isotopes of each other. Okay? So they're different mass uh, atoms that are the same type of atom. Notice the number of neutrons is different in the two chlorine atoms. 